So, Father, thank you so much. We welcome you to come in, Holy Spirit, to teach us. Father, Lord, you're above all, through all, and in us all. And we appreciate the Lordship of Jesus, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Those that hopefully usually come on a Thursday, uh, I mean, excuse me, on a Wednesday night, encourage them. Maybe they can meet up on a Friday on the ladies' Bible study. We appreciate them and bless them in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. all right, how to reach for excellence. Okay, amen. Because it's been a how-to series, a lot of Christians are really looking for the how-tos. How do I do this, Pastor Kerry? How do I go about doing How do I go about claiming my family for God? What do I do about, you know, appropriating the promises? You know, what's the scripture say about judging? We, we cover a lot of this. But a lot of Christians sometimes don't know what to do. Or maybe they do know what they should do. But maybe they don't know how to do it. And so that's why I prepared this, this uh, series. Okay? All right. So God says, I will not leave you comfortless. Yet a little while I'll come to you. Right? So we must allow our teacher and coach, the Holy Spirit, to guide us into and to help us develop into the quality of a Christian that we should be throughout every aspect of our lives. We should reach for excellence, right? Now, I stopped reading the paragraph here for a minute. Just to put this out in front of you. Who do you have living inside of you? Jesus. Amen. Many Christians forget You'll hear songs saying, God's walking beside me. And you know that, he is. But they forget also he's walking in. Let me just give you quick four revelations that will cause you to be at ease. How many here need more ease? More rest? Could use some more. As long as you don't fall asleep while you're driving. No, amen. First revelation I want to give you is God is for you. God so loved the world. He, he's for us, right? And if God be for us, who can be against us? Not only that, but we have a song, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So that tells us no matter where we go, God is. He's omnipresent. Say omnipresent. And then the revelation of God in us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Do you know Christians don't get up in the morning, don't think about this? God's for me today. Some people wonder, you know, God's against them. God, don't get up on the wrong side of the bed. <laughs> okay, so that revelation is Christ in us, right? Woo! We're inhabited by God. And the last revelation is what I call the revelation that completes the miraculous. And that is you are in God. So you got God with us. You got God for us. You got God in us. And we are in God. No wonder the devil's having a fit. No wonder he wants us to be religious. So you and I as Christians are knowing all that. Gee, Carrie, I love to know that. Knowing all that, then we know we can be excellent. Not by ourselves, Not by just studying. Not just by training. But by the Holy Spirit. By the power of God in us. Right? Isn't it God working in us? Yeah. Isn't God the one that begun a good work? Amen. Isn't it God that works in us to do his good will and pleasure? Amen. And so he can bring us to excellence. excellence. Yes. Right? Because he is excellent. Yes. So we want to open our text up, 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You want to follow along? It says, for it is God who commanded the light. Everyone say commanded light. Can you think of another scripture over in, first, in John 1? And the light shineth into darkness and the darkness can't overwhelm it. Listen to what this says. 
And it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in the hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Now, we've been talking a lot about focusing on Christ, haven't we? And James chapter 1 says, we are to look in the mirror and be a doer of the word and not a hearer only, right? Because if we, not a doer, but just a hearer, it's like a natural man who looks in the mirror and seizes himself and goes away and forgets what manner of man he was. That's telling us that we need to keep our focus on Jesus so we continually absorb the image of God, the proper image of God. Hello? What's it say in 2 Corinthians 3.18? You might want to write these scriptures down because they're not in there. But it says, we with an open face. Everyone say open face. As beholding in a glass. 2 Corinthians 3.18. As beholden in a glass, the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into the same image. So here we see this scripture, 2 Corinthians 4 again, verse 6. For it is God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus. So when we start focusing on Jesus, God begins to give us revelation. Hello. When we begin to focus on doing, now listen, doing something for Jesus. Like for example, Peggy says, you know, we need to have this done in the church. I really feel led of God to do this. She sees a revelation of doing that in the spirit. Yeah, we need a cheerleading class. So I'm going to lead it. That's you, Peg, you know. But you see, that's how it works. You don't decide, hey, I, I'm going to do this. No, you, you, you begin to focus on Jesus and he begins to pop out of you the things he's placed in you at the right time. Someone say amen. amen. Okay, so he shows the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Now look at verse 7. But we have this treasure... Say treasure. treasure. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Here's what happens. We hear a good sermon. Five steps to be excellent. First is to seek God early. Two is to do this. Two is to do that. Now that sounds great to have points. I call them talking points. But listen. Many ser sermons today are just talking points. And talking points only relate to your soul. Their psychology. You want the word. You just don't want a talking point. You want the word first, then talking points. You just don't want to say, somebody say to you, you just need to get up and pray more. And you need to go to lunch and then read your Bible more. And the third thing you need to do, to, 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 to see, so it's relating to the soul of a person. But what's missing is the power for us to follow through and become excellent. We can all look at, oh yeah, I need to be excellent. I need to really be better. But it's God in us that brings us into that betterness. Can you say amen? But the trick Satan does... Is he gets us to try to do those steps. And that's why sometimes a 12 step program doesn't work for some people. Because they're only applying it in their head. Not their heart. We call it head knowledge. So if you're going to be excellent as a, as a good Christian. You've got to learn to back up. And let God take the front in your, in your leading of your life. Say amen someone. Amen. Amen. So the power and the excellency is of God and not of us. So we don't make ourselves better. Well we try and we want to. Because it's, we need to have goals right? 
You never set any goals. If you're, you're planning a trip and you don't know where you're going to go. Some people read their Bible. And Judas went out and hung himself. Go out and do likewise, you know. Not, you know, the case of raw, so raw. They don't have any plot or plan. They don't have any steps. And listen, your very life is ordered out for you. You have to get up in the morning. You have your routine. Whatever it is, however lazy or not lazy it is, whatever steps you go to the bathroom first, you do this, you do, you have your routines. Those are your steps. But something has to go deeper than the steps. Is your relationship with God in those steps? Can you say amen? amen? So a couple of points I want to give you right in your notes. Number one, as we focus on Jesus and not our circumstances, God reveals the light of the knowledge of his glory, his doxa, his honor and praise, and that which is worshipped. So as we focus on him, and we're looking and say, Lord, I don't know quite how to do that. I can tell you there are a hundred times in the last four months. You know, God showed me little things to do in the kitchen and little things to do out there on the deck and stuff better than I was doing. You see, we get traditionally in ruts. You've done it this way. It works this way. Why change anything? Well, listen, is God smarter than you? then do it his way. I don't care how smart you are. Let God show you how to be smarter. That's what excellence is. It's not saying you're not smart. Okay? But for you to think that you have arrived at anything is absolute vanity. What did Solomon say? Vanity, vanity. It's like if Jesus walked up and ran that sound system, Danny would suddenly see a million things he could do better. But you know, he's doing great things now. And then he's giving it off to my wife. Woo! And so that's why it's so cool that you and I, doesn't matter what we're doing. I don't want to hang on the negative. But bringing God in, saying, God, help me with this, makes everything go a lot better. I don't know why anybody doesn't, you know, start off their routines asking God to get involved with them before they get started. No, they'll get up there and go through the motions, and then they'll forget to pray to ask God to help. Why? And then what happened? There's a breakdown. Something flies off the handle. And the next person that comes up to you is the pastor and say, did you pray? Oh, now you feel like a hundred pound side of a popsicle stick because we need to be excellent. And if we're going to be excellent, we got to tap to the excellent source. We got to talk to the excellent one and we got to do it first time. Everyone say amen. amen. It'd be like me going up in that sound booth. The only thing I'll make up there is a mess. I need to be taught. And so nobody think you've arrived at anything. Hello. And if you don't believe me, ask God to give you a glimpse of heaven. He gives you a glimpse of heaven, you go, I don't know nothing. Amen. You get it? So we depend on him all the time. And the more you depend on him, the better your life will even out. And the happier you'll be. The more you depend on him. But oh no, we got to do it on our own. And then we'll talk, and then we'll start getting cocky about it, and everything will break down at once. Because we're trying to be the showman and not letting Jesus be the showman. All right, we need to be excellent. So we focus on who? We talk about who? Amen. Second point I want to make is the power of his excellence dwells in each one of us. So the more excellent we appear outwardly is because we have spent excellent time with him inwardly. Say amen, somebody. The ability to display excellence is the quality of God on the outside of what we do and say. Second scripture is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly. That sounds like excellence to me, right? exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Wow. And that's why one day God says, son, I'm, I'm a little bit bigger than how you interpret me. 
You think I'm this way and I am that way. But I'm much larger than that. And anytime you get some kind of idea where you think I'm limited to that, take that off. So if you can imagine me looking in and seeing everything everyone does, thinks, and speaks all at one time, and I have an absolute perfect readout, wouldn't you behave better? <laughs> yes, I certainly will. Can you say amen? All right, so I'm kind of funning with you, but that's, that's exactly where we're at. So the thing is, is if we know this, let's just let it make us more excellent. All right. If Peggy got any more excellent, I don't know what we'd do. Yeah. Must be your night for name dropping or something. Sorry about that. So, so again, it says... It says, now to him is able to do exceeding above and beyond anything we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory. See, whatever is accomplished has to be for the glory of God. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. A couple of points underneath that scripture. Number one, we must depend upon and learn to tap into the source of power within us that brings about excellence. Two, can you get the right picture? When you look at a project and ask God for a minute or two before you launch out into it to give you his picture of how he wants it done, works better that way. You know, just kind of make a mental note about it. It's no big deal. You know, I mean, it is if you do it his way. I love to do it his way. It sure takes a lot less time. No frustration. Oh, well, why didn't I think about that? He says, well, because you're, you're bound by traditions and don't know it. He's talking to me now. I'm not talking to you. We have little traditions that we do, don't we? Why did you put the hole in the corner of the, the, the meatloaf? Well, because my mom always used to, she said it cooked better that way. So, he, so I'm going to go ask grandma. And he goes, ask grandma, why'd you put, he says, my first little oven, it wouldn't fit in there and I had to knock a little notch off of it. <laughs> so sometimes we do things because it's handed down. We know it works, but we don't bother asking God to make it better. Why not? Because we probably just forget. We just can remind everybody how good God is. How many here, God did something for you today was amazing? Amen. Open your eyes and notice those things. He does them for each person every day. Little things. And I, I can't help but think, just a thought, that he doesn't watch you and see how sensitive you are. If you're not half asleep all the time. Not picking on you, but you know, if we notice those, and let me tell you, you as you get older in the Lord and more confident in your relationship with God, more of those things you notice, they just stick out everywhere. Oh, that's cool, God. I wouldn't have stepped over it before, wouldn't even recognized it, you know. So we've got to slow down sometimes for the excellence to rise up. Say amen, somebody. So, do you get the right picture in your life what excellence would be for you? It's not a new job. It's doing better at the job you have. Hello. Promotions come from excellence. Not from complaining. Usually in a good world. There's a lot of shenanigans out there. Okay. All right. So, don't limit your thinking and asking. Like, for example, and, and catch yourself. I'm going to, you might fit this and I'm not picking on you. I wish, I wish, I wish I did this. I wish I had this. I wish, I wish. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? You're dreaming and you're not in reality. It's okay to dream, but to, the feet got to hit the pavement sometime. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, wishbones are, you know. <laughs> and so you listen to yourself. I wish, you know, I wish somebody just gave me this. I could do this. 
and I wish, and yeah, there you go. And, and you know what's going to happen? God's going to start pointing your wisher out and saying, believe, don't wish. Believe, don't wish. Amen. I won't do it because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> All right, my next scripture. You already have excellence in your spirit. Can you anybody tell me what the scripture says about your spirit? Now that you're born again, what's the, what's the Bible say about your recreated human spirit? It's perfect. It's perfect. Why is it perfect? Because God came and took out the fallen nature and put himself in there. Is God perfect? That's why you read it over in James 1. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Okay? And whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning, right? In other words, he doesn't change. So the changing factor is us. So to keep from varying off the blessed, excellent path is presenting ourselves to God and measuring up every morning. Measure up every morning so he gets you going on that day. Doesn't take long. Lord, I come to you. <laughs> and I spilled coffee on my leg. And I'm just telling you, I love you, God. And you just get together and you relate. And then I'm going to stop and I'm just going to breathe in. I'm just going to breathe you out. I'm just going to just love and just dwell on you. And you can sense his spirit because you're focusing on him. Start to permeate and saturate you. And then you want to go until you feel like God says, all filled up. Click. Oil's changed, air in the tires. Huh? Everything's been topped up. That's why I go to see God every day. Because I know what I'm like without being filled up. I'm not so pleasant sometimes. Although I like everybody to think that I'm Mr. Charming. And those of my family that watch and everything, stop chuckling. All right, here we go. So we have excellence in our heart. Colossians, the scripture that uh, Peggy partly quoted, which is excellent. Colossians 2, verses 8 through 10. Listen to what Paul says to the church at Colossae. Now, just for your note, the church at Colossae was in a guy's name, uh, Philemon's house. That's where we get the book of Philemon. He had a huge mansion. I don't know how big it was, but the church was there in his house, the church at Colossae. Can you say amen? And they were intellectuals. Now the church at Corinth, this is all going to make sense in a minute, were a bunch of hippies. Partiers and hippies. Anything goes. So then when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he has to tell them, straighten up. Got the first letter, how to lay everything in order. Second letter's a, letter's a rebuke. And he has a straight, now why? Because hippies will, they have no moral sense, kind of. If you are watching and you used to be one, so did I, so I'm not picking on us. I just know that I had all the free love I, I needed. What I needed is Jesus, see. Anyway, but the Colossians, they were intellectual. They were Smart, And so it took a lot more to convince them other than, hey, join the wagon. We're heading over to uh, San Francisco, <laughs> you see. And so it's harder to convince somebody who's intellectual because they get, need to know why a lot of times. Well, let's go on past that. That's what Paul's relating when he's relating at the church at Corinth. So listen, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. See, remember they were headstrong. They were philosophers. An empty deceit. According to, to traditions of men. According to the basic principles of the world. And not according to Christ. Verse 9. For in him, that is in Christ, dwells all of the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now listen to this next scripture. I got the hiccups. Verse 10 says, and you are complete. You are complete in him. So let me try to say this. Imagine God came into your spirit complete, but he came in in seed form. 
He's not a seed. But then it says that in Galatians, until that seed is born. That seed meaning Christ. So it says over in 1 John, when we accept Jesus, if you have the seed remaining in you. So what I'm trying to show you is, God puts a perfect seed in there, and it's through our faith towards God and our desire to obey the word that the seed grows and germinates. Okay, perfect as it is, undeveloped. And as we begin to apply and our faith and go through the life's race set before us, we grow in the Lord. The Lord's perfection develops and it begins to take over our thinking and it begins to take over our actions until Christ be formed in us, until the day star arise in our heart. But it takes a process of time. That's why we, us older saints, older, when you see the babies come in, they should be on your phone Rolodex and you should be on the phone to them because they're not like you, seasoned and you're going nowhere. They're susceptible. So guess what? Auntie Denise calls them up. I didn't see a Bible study. What's going on? And Grandma BJ. Man, oh, I wish you would have been there. Man, we had such a great time. You see, follow through, older saints. That's your job. Not mine. That's your job. Okay? Follow through. Write him a letter. Get him encouragement. Give him a call. Pester him. Next time I see you, you better repent. <laughs> anyway, let's go on. Well, all right, so, and we are complete in him who's the head of all principality and power. You have the seed in you. So, doesn't matter if the seed is barely developed or developed. You still have the same authority of God. You still have the same power of God. But it's not fully through your life yet. Because it's not fully spread. And so the scripture says, even though the kingdom of God is such as the smallest mustard seed. Imagine, everyone watch my fingers. Mustard seed dropped into your spirit. Though it be smaller than all the other things in your life. Other seeds. It will sprout out great branches. Great influence that even the fowls of the year will come and lodge in his branches. What's it saying? So when God come in your life, if you continue to nurture him and your relationship with him, it will be such a great influence that people will come and hang around you. You can have such a positive influence. Just look at Solomon. Look at David. Look at, people wanted to be around men and women of God. Now, if they're running, for you, running from you, whoop, we better change something. Just joking. All right. So let's move on to our, our next scripture. So everyone say, I have God in me. I am I'm excellent. I'm excellent. Until I open my mouth. No. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. A couple of points. Number one, you are complete in him. Seed form, if you can imagine that. So as you praise him, as you exercise, and we're talking baby Christians. They got born again last Sunday. And get them, make sure they're followed up on, make sure they're reading their Bible. Somebody sit down with them a little bit and, and go over some things, you know, and don't let them flounder out there, assuming that they're okay. Breaks pastors' hearts. And you know, have you ever had a pastor call after you? I know I have. Many, many of you. But you know what happens to pastors when they call after people? Whoa, it's the pastor. I used to drop in on people. Pull up on a summer day, you know, and the windows be down and everything. I'll pull up, you know, and just drop by because I was in the area. And don't ever do that. I didn't know any better. And you hear, honey, put the bong and the beer away. Pastor just drove up. Literally. And see, I don't really care to know about any of your junk. I care that you're going to be in heaven. I care that you're going to have a relationship with God. You see what I'm saying? 
And so a lot of times when pastor calls around, immediately, it's kind of like you hear your name on the over, on the PA, and immediately, uh, Terry, come to the office. Immediately, you don't think you're going to get an award. That's not usually what goes through your head the first time. So you know what I'm saying. I'm just kind of funning with you. All right. So say I'm excellent. I'm excellent. All right. So listen. Folks, if we're going to be excellent and grow in excellence, we got to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Hello. Walk in the spirit. What? And you'll walk in excellence. Listen, the Holy Spirit's not in a hurry. If you ever felt like you had to hurry up, had to hurry up, you know there are people who live that way. They're always so slow at everything that I've got to hurry up to get there on time, and they're never on time. And all they have to do is sit down and say, God, I've not been doing it your way. This whole time I've been running after you in my own strength. I need you to straighten my whole mess up. I've been late all my life, God. What's wrong with that? Lots. See, when we get to that place of excellence, we now have to begin to have a talk with ourselves. Can you have a talk with yourself? Remember when mom and dad used to have a talk with you? Maybe some of you can't remember that far back. Hello? I'm going to get to poon. Oh, yeah. A wooden spoon, you know. But uh, I remember my dad used to grab the belt. He didn't have to get the belt. He only got it once, but he grabbed the belt and it'd be all over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There was a standard of excellence there. But see, what I'm, what I'm getting at is, is we need to be quick to hear. Why? Because people that talk too much never hear what they need to hear. People that talk too much, it could be the fact is they can't stand silence. Just going to throw a couple of things out. I'm, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, okay? Be quick to hear if you're going to have excellence. You're on a job first time, don't say anything. Shut up, and yes sir, no sir, and don't try to offer your opinion about stuff. I, otherwise they're going to look at you and say, I'm going to have to deal with this person later. We think we're cute and they think you're a doof. Believe me, I've been a boss. I've hired many people, okay? And the worst thing I want to do is hear you come in and tell me about yourself if I haven't asked. Somebody needed to hear that. Let's move on past all that. Okay, now listen. So, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. People that talk too much, don't hear enough, always get angry easy. But don't get angry anyway. Can you say me? Walk in the spirit. Okay, my next point. Seek to please who? God, not man. Say amen, everybody. Seek to please God and not man. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Listen to this one. Verses 1 through 4. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Say amen somebody. Amen. For you know the, what, what the commandments are we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God and your sanctification that means being set apart that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Folks I'm going to say this and, and I don't mean to be gross but people in the world we were made to have sex, but under marriage and produce children. For people that have no God, they don't know any different. Sex to them is a thrill. For men, it's different than women. And it employs on people terribly, okay? So, it's always good for God to get a hold of your life as soon as possible. So you don't have to go through some of that misery and heartache. And we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That each of you should know, listen to this next one, verse 4. Each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Do you know how to conduct yourself? Do you always have to be the person with the last word? Center of attention? 
The idea is, whatever it is, I mean, I'm just throwing out things. The, the idea behind it is, is we need to possess ourselves so, in God so that the enemy doesn't mess with us. Can you say amen? I mean, if you're running around with your shirt button crooked and your shoelaces untied and you wish somebody would have told you an hour ago and nobody had the nerve to say anything to you. What do you why are you you're talking about that? Well, if we would sit down and ask God, how are we doing? Maybe we won't caught, be caught with our shoelaces untied and our shirt looking misfuddled. In other words, it's okay if you just get up. It's okay to be misfuddled, but not share Jesus that way. Can you say amen? amen. Can you imagine just getting off a bus? You haven't shaved in a week. You smell like you haven't bathed in a week. And you go right up to somebody and say, I want to tell you about Jesus. So I, I used a terrible example there just to let you know. Personality can make you smell. Attitude. Hello? So with excellence, we don't have to be concerned about any of that. Guess what? We go into the car wash every morning with Jesus. He buffs us out, buffs us up. He gives us wisdom and knowledge. I just want to let you know that the people that don't do that, if you, you can see them. They look like they got splotches on them. They look like they just ran over the neighbor's dog and the neighbor's after them. They're unpleasant, unhappy. And they go, let's love Jesus. Moving right along. Okay. Let's become obedient. If we're going to be excellent, we need to obey. Can you say amen? And I want to tell you something about God. This is what I've learned through the years. God will tell you about doing little things. And he'll watch you see if you do. And if you do, he'll bless you. So you'll want to do more little things that he asks. But if you're not careful and you get up on the wrong side of the bed and you stop, dis you start disobeying and you don't mean to, but you happen to have four or five days of disobedience, then now you're on a downwill spire. You need to stop everything and set yourself right. Now, you wouldn't have that problem if we met with God first thing, but sometimes we don't. We forget. Come on, let's be honest. We don't, then all of a sudden we get into a place where we're just not ourselves. Don't panic. Nobody's going to hate you. Stop. Do the responsible thing and say, God, I'm out of tune. You know, you ever seen a guitar player up there and they can see and you can hear that they're not in tune? What do they do? Well, nowadays they have a little button down. They can hit that button, move out from the rest of the deal, tune the guitar and not change the song or anything. But back then it was ding, 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 do, 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 do. ding, 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 do, do, do. That's where a lot of Christians are at. Always playing tune up somewhere at the end of the day when you should have got tuned up, tuned in at the first of the day. Then the blessing starts rolling right away. Okay, say I got it. I got it. Good, I don't ever want to see a frown on your faces again. Just, I'm just joking. Okay, so let's go on. Become obedient. Philippians 2, look at this, 12 through 14. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How many know that Paul's not talking about works? He's talking about working the dough, working the seed that's in you, God, out into your thinking, your speaking, and your acting. Work out. In other words, squeeze out God. People are tired of hearing you. <laughs> they want to hear God come from you. They want to hear what God has been saying to you. I'm going to start stopping you on a Sunday and say, what's God told you this week? And then I'll know if you've been listening or not. No. Well, I don't like putting people on the spot. And I don't like to be put on the spot, so I won't do anything like that. But think about it. What have you been doing? You're not getting any younger. Don't assume 
everything is boo-boo, you know? Don't do that. Go to God and say, am I doing okay, Lord? He's always going to encourage you, even if you're not doing okay. The idea is now he's got your attention, he can help you. But when we walk off, assume everything's fine because nothing broke in the last week, then we take our ease. Did you know what God said to the Israelites? Why did the Israelites always complain? There's many reasons. Why did the Israelites, after they got a miracle, they went right off and complained again? God had healed the waters. He'd rained down manna. He'd do all that. Why did they all complain? Because they didn't apply it to God and their relationship with God. They thought God was a big taskmaster up there. It's going to whack them any time. I remember what he said to Moses. God said to Moses, I want to get rid of them. And Moses says, no, God, that's not in your plan. You know, wow, read it. It's pretty eye-opening. But the idea is God didn't make any flaws and he didn't goof up. All right, let's go on. We need to become obedient. So listen, okay? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to do his will do for his good pleasure. Couple of points. We walk by faith, and that pleases God, right? Number two, being not entangled with the world pleases God. Do you know what entangled means? When you get entangled in some thickets, when you get entangled in some maybe blackberry bushes, it means you're caught up in it. God doesn't want us caught up in the world. He wants us caught up in him. He says, you want some toys? Get caught up in me. And I'll supply to every one of your need. But oh no, we'll go out and buy it on our own. Boy, God provided that. And how much are the payments? Moving right along. Man, I tell you, Holy Spirit, stop that. <laughs> He's kind of putting his finger on stuff. Okay, so now, a couple points. I love this, okay? When we obey God, God rewards every time. God, why? Because God will not owe anybody anything. He will be, as scripture says, he will not be indebted to anyone. That's why people, even if they're not saved, know how to give. Even if they're going to go to hell, they can give their way out of just about anything. Because it works. Then you go to the Christians, and they're going, oh, I don't know, God. You asked me to give an extra amount this time. Well, you know my finances. Well, like, yeah. we know you're a traditional person run by them. You see, we got to be ready. If he says, give $1,000. Now, let me just tell you, he's not going to tell you, give 1000 if you don't have it. So please, no rubber checks. They keep a bouncing back to you. No. But, but, but if God, let's say you got some and you thought, man, that vacation is looking sweet. And God says, I want you to give this extra $200 here. Oh, no, God, I'm saving for my vacation. Now you have, now you put yourself in a place where you shouldn't be. Say, Lord, I'll give the whole thing to you if you want. And God says, no, I don't want any. I just want to see how obedient you'd be. I want to show you that you're pretty selfish. See, because God knows, but we're not catching it sometimes. So once in a while, he'll do something like that. But we need to become obedient. Can you say amen? amen. No, I'm not looking for you to write me a $1,000 check. <laughs> you can relax those coming in by the, the, the... I'm just joking about that. God meets our need, and we follow the principles, though. And that's why he doesn't meet our need, because we walk by faith, right? Amen. All right, look at our next scripture, okay? We need to learn to keep your word. Say amen. amen. Don't tell me you're going to be at church and not show up without a good excuse. So he said, you're too much. Of a big well, how about you told the president you were going to show up? He moved heaven and earth just to get a place for you. And at the last minute, you forgot to call him and said you can't. 
And you think, oh man, God, I want to really use that person. Just think about it. God is the most perfect investor of his time, of anything that he has. God is perfect. So he wants to invest himself in us, and he's believing that you and I will be obedient. Say amen. amen. So we need to learn to keep our word. Psalms 15, 4, the latter part of it says, And he who keeps his oath even when it hurts. When you swear by your own hurt, keep it, even if it's going to make you look dorky. I told you it would be there, and I, somebody tried it. I'm going to keep my word to you. And that's why when I say something, I try to keep my word. I really try my best. I miss up too. But you always try. Why? Because God needs you to be integral. You need to know that chair you sit in is going to hold your body. Okay? God needs to know that you got it together enough that he can count on you. Someone say amen. All right. So listen to this. Matthew 5. 33 through 37 says, again, I have heard that it was said, or you have heard that it was said though, by those of old, you shall not swear falsely. You shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, nor it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it's God's footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the, the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let each say yes be yes, or let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Woo! Folks, I, I shared this last week. We'll do it again. They had in the Old Testament schools of prophets. And they, one of the things they taught was self-disciplines. Now, we see something like that where you, you see the Buddhist monks and people doing all that. And, but that's just a perversion of the truth. But the prophets of old, they would separate from everybody. And they would go into a school learning how to speak. How to talk, how to talk from the Lord, what was good prophecy, what was wrong prophecy. And there were schools of them. Now, we didn't hear a lot of them doing a lot of good. But in the Bible, we can see John the Baptist. What does it say of John the Baptist? He was the greatest prophet of all the prophets of the Old Testament. Right? But you don't hear him prophesying too much. But then there was Elijah. How about Elijah? How about all these other prophets? Jeremiah the weeping prophet. They were all schooled that their words meant something. And then we run off. Oh, that just tickles me to death. <laughs> they learned to talk right. They learned to project God. Can you say amen? How much more in the New Testament should we learn? And we're filled with God. Can you say amen? So let your yea be yea and anything more than that comes from the evil one. So don't give your words out lightly. Hey, let's do lunch. Then you ever see him again. Hello. Make sure you can follow through. It's just important. Why? Your character. You know? After you do something for a while, people are going to know you by what you do, not what you say. Oh, here comes the late one. They probably won't ever say anything, but that's the first thought they think. So why give them that opportunity? Lord, change me. Make me excellent. Somebody was said one time, and I, I, I had to really correct them. I really don't care what anybody thinks. I'm serving God. Well, the whole thing you just said was totally demonic. You're serving God as a witness to others. That you love God and your life's together because of God. You can't run around and say, I could care less what people think. You care enough to behave yourself, I hope. <laughs> Hello? Moving right along. 
God, you get me in these little ruts and I got to get out. So I'm over already. Okay, here we go. So don't give your word lightly. You are only as good as your word. Two, don't be hasty in saying things. Hasty means too quick. Think first. People depend on what you say. Second point is show gratitude. Everyone say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Make a little note. I'm going to thank God at least 15 times a, a day. And I'm not going to do it all at one time. Put a little notes up there. Lord, I'm thankful for this. When I, when I walk into the room, one of the first things I want to do is tell my wife I love her. How pretty she is. And she made a commitment. She's never told me this. But every time I tell her I love her, she made a commitment that she was going to say she loves me back. Now, I'm, she never said that. But I know God said that. That's commitment because it doesn't matter. If I go, I love you, dear. She goes, I love you too, dear. <laughs> Isn't that right, honey? I only know that by the Spirit. She never ever told me. But anyway, what good does that have to do? We want to believe the best of each other. You, want, you don't want to be known by your dirty underwear. Can you say amen? So moving right on past this. Show gratitude. Show thankfulness. Psalms 34, 1 through 3. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. And the humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Okay? And let us exalt his name together. Yes. Be grateful. Being grateful opens the heavens. Okay? Being thankful shows appreciation. Hello. Amen. Have you ever had given something to somebody and you're waiting for a thank you and they just walked off like it was no big deal? It still hurts. Even though it's not supposed to. Walk in love, everybody. If you're going to be excellent, love is the higher way. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For everyone that loves is born of God. And knoweth God, he that loveth not, knoweth not God. For God is love. Be he loved. Let us love one another. First John 7 and 8. 4, 7 and 8. Amen. So to love really is of an excellent spirit. Can you say amen? People are measuring people by how much they are loving and forgiving. Two, because God is love, we need to display him. Three, everybody should know you by your love. Amen. And the final, always display a joyous attitude. You ever notice when you're not so happy, what's the first thing people say to you? What's the matter? Well, you really don't want that kind of attention, do you? So take the lip and shove it up there and make a smile. I, I developed, when I was going through so much pain with my foot, and I'm going through a lot of hurt. And people were betraying me. A lot of people just up and left when I got injured. You know, all the people put your hand on your back. And say, I just love you. I'm looking at them and say, what's it going to take for you to leave? You know, because that's usually what happens. People, don't do that. Don't do any of that. That's, that's just a mess. Always display a joyous attitude. Doesn't matter. Can you say amen? So I developed this smile. Even when I'm hurting and in pain. You want to see it? <laughs> I squint my eyes. And I smile. And I'm probably in a really tremendous amount of pain. But you're not going to get a scowl off of me. So develop a smile. You know? Just a minute. <laughs> Anyway, for those who came in tonight, bless you. Father, we just pray for you. We pray for all of the ones tonight. Lord, bless each and everybody. And Lord God, help them to just be filled with love for you, God. And Lord, throughout the week, show them the things to come. In Jesus' name, we all said.